Welcome everyone to the Newburyport Literary Festival. My name is Jennifer Entwistle and I am the co-director. We're a small but dedicated group of volunteers bringing readers and, and authors together. And we've been doing this for the past 16 years. But uh, this is actually, since we went virtual, we were able to do our biggest festival ever this weekend. Um, we had a great day yesterday and we've got uh, the wonderful Lily King with us today with Meg Mitchell Moore um, and more events after this one and all afternoon. So if this is the first time you're tuning in, check out our schedule. I'm sure there's other events that you'll want to sign up for for the rest of the day. Now we are using Zoom webinar, which means that uh, you will be able to see and hear the panelists, but we can't see and hear you. So we do encourage you to use the chat so that you can have discussions throughout the event. But if you have any questions for the author, please use the Q&A tool that's at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, that's where the questions will get queued up for Lily and we'll be taking uh, doing a Q&A towards the end of the session. Um, I do wanna thank A Mighty Blaze for partnering with us. They were instrumental uh, to our success last year, moving from an in-person to an online festival, and they are live streaming us again this year. So this event uh, can be seen on the Mighty Blaze Facebook page. Um, my last bit of housekeeping is that I want to give a shout out to our local booksellers. We are partnering with two of our local independent stores, Jabberwocky Bookshop in Newburyport and the Bookshop of Beverly Farms. Um, we hope that you will support them and buy your festival books there. But if you have a favorite local indie in your neighborhood, um, by all means, throw your support to them. Um, yesterday was Independent Bookseller Day. So um, I, I like to think of every day as Independent Bookseller <laughs> Day. <laughs> um, so please uh, give them your support and buy your books from, from a local indie. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Meg Mitchell Moore. She's a national best-selling author of six novels. The latest, Two Truths and a Lie, takes place in and around Newburyport. Before turning to fiction, she wrote and edited for a variety of magazines and newspapers. She lives here in Newburyport with her husband and her three daughters. Welcome. Thank you, Jen. And it's my pleasure to introduce Lily King. <laughs> Lily King grew up in Massachusetts and received her BA in English literature from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and her MA in creative writing from Syracuse University. Writers and Lovers is her fifth novel. Her fourth novel, Euphoria, won the Kirkus Award for Fiction in 2014, the New England Book Award for Fiction in the same year, and was a finalist in the National Book Critics Circle Awards. Writers and Lovers, which was published March 2020, was named a top book of the year by NPR, People, The New York Times, Kirkus, me, and many other people. It was also a Read with Jenna pick for the Today Show, a book of the month selection, and it's newly out in paperback. So if you haven't read it yet, you can pick it up very soon at one of your independent bookstores. This book has been called A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Woman, and its narrator is 31-year-old writer Casey Peabody, who is working as a waitress in Cambridge in 1997 while she completes her first novel. And it's a book about grief and love and an aspiring writer finally finding her voice. Lily King currently lives in Portland, Maine. She has a husband, two college-age daughters, two dogs, enviable curly hair, which I've always loved. And it's my pleasure to welcome her to the festival. Hi, Lily. Hi, thank you so, so much, Meg and Jennifer and everybody at the festival. I'm so glad to be here. Well, we're very happy to have you. And I know we had you in person when I think it was when Father of the Rain came out, right? Yeah, and yeah. Nice to have you back. Oh, it was so fun. So you mentioned when we spoke a couple of weeks ago that your expectations for this book, Writers and Lovers, weren't sky high. And then it came out right at the beginning of the pandemic, which is... <laughs> a challenge and somehow even so all of the stars aligned and you got all of this wonderful attention in all of the right places at all of the right times which is really like winning the lottery you know you can't you can hope for all of that but you can't really plan for it and as a result so many people read and loved this book and I know so many more people will still discover it so what why weren't your expectations that high in the beginning was it the pressure of following up euphoria or something else 
yeah, there was definitely the pressure. Uh, also, it, you know, I mean, I, it often happens to me where I write one book and then I write an entirely, entirely different book. And so I, I feel I, I don't have a lot of expectation that that people who liked the last book will follow me to the to the new one because it is so different and you know uh, appeals to what I think of as possibly a different audience. But it, um, you know, fortunately it, it wasn't true in this case. I feel like people did follow me to writers and lovers and I never have much confidence. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I don't think most writers do, right. I, I don't know. Do you, when, you know, like when you're writing a book, do you think this is just so good? I have high expectations yeah. for this, I never do. Never, ever, ever, ever. And it's so good to hear that you say that, but that actually leads right into my next question, which is this is a book about writing, but somehow it appeals to non-writers as much as to writers, which I think is almost impossible to pull off. And you pulled it off <laughs> and recommended to this book to all my writer friends and all my non-writer friends and everyone I know and everybody has loved it. So just congratulations on that. That's, people say that can't be done, but you did it. So um, that's wonderful. But I just wanted to read this little part, speaking of being nervous about putting your work out into the world, and this is your narrator talking after she has sent her novel out to a bunch of agents and she's waiting for those first awful rejections that everybody gets. And she says, uh, I try to soothe myself with thoughts of agents reading my manuscript, but my feelings about the novel start to shift. Soon, any thought of it scalds me with shame. I think about the first few pages and panic blooms in my chest and spreads like fire to my extremities. And that is to me <laughs> such a perfect description of the feeling of first putting your work out there. But, you know, I read that and I thought, well, there's no way Lily King feels that way. I mean, I wonder, <laughs> she wrote you forehand. She wrote these books. How can she feel that way? So, do you still feel that way every single time you put your work out into the world? Absolutely. I mean, a hundred percent, maybe even worse and worse because, you know, at first you didn't feel like you were going to have one reader, you know? And, and so I didn't, I don't know. And now, now that I have some readers, you know, it's even more terrifying. I can't even think about them while I'm writing it. Mm -hmm. I just have to think about myself as a reader and what I like and, that's how I kind of get through the, the drafts. Um, but, but yes, I mean, oh, that first, with this one, um, I remember giving it to my agent. I mean, my husband always reads it first, but he, you know, he's like my biggest cheerleader and he, he kind of knows that's his role. And so he can't really deviate it from, deviate from it all that much. <laughs> and so, you know, I always get the good, you know, thumbs up from him. But then I gave it to my agent and oh, I just remember, I, I didn't think she would read it for a long time. And uh, I, I thought I had at least a week and she called me, I think she called me in like 12 hours or something. Oh my gosh. <laughs> And I didn't think, I didn't think she'd read it. I thought she was going to tell me that she was sick or that, you know, <laughs> something, some sort of excuse. And she called me up crying and I'll just never, ever, ever, ever forget that moment. I mean, I know I burst into tears because it was just, I was so shocked. I was so shocked that, that the book could elicit any emotion from anyone, you know, and I don't know, it was, that was, that was really like such a, a wonderful moment with this book and and it was very reassuring you know because i i really trust her and right. so that was my first moment of feeling like okay maybe 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 this will not be as bad as i think it is right. <laughs> and it's sort of like in the book when muriel reads the book and that yeah. she's waiting and waiting and then she calls and said i love it so much on the answering machine well, because it's 97 oh. the answering machine she said <laughs> she's screaming that so i love that part because you are waiting for that one person yes that to say that and then you feel like okay now it's okay you know um so i really loved that um yeah. now i'm gonna skip ahead because i did have a question about Mur muriel while we're talking about her but i yeah. love that relationship between the narrator and her writer friend muriel who is the one who convinces her it's time to get the outside readers for her novel finally and get it ready to send her out to agents and what i loved about their friendship was it's so kind and helpful without any hint of malice or envy, even though they are both writers, you know, hoping for publication. Um, 
I just loved that they were able to help each other and look outside what they were going through when the other needed help. Do you have friends who are writers yourself who do that? I've had so many along the way, so many Muriels in my life. And I've been so, so lucky. And I've never, I've never um, had that experience of, of competition. I mean, it just, it isn't like a, you know, a sport where you're, you're playing against each other or I, I don't know. It just, the, 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 it's very wide. Publishing is wide. Readership is wide. You know, there's no reason it's not finite. I, you know, people can read lots and lots and lots of books in a year. And I don't know, I, I've never felt that it was a, a competitive thing. And I've, I've never had had friends who kind of played that way. So I've been really, really lucky and have had just so many um, contemporaries who have been such mentors to me. Right. And from the very beginning, since high school, you know. Yeah. Um, I remember that Ellen Hildebrand, who's been a huge help to, to me in my books, she once said to me, you know, don't worry don't worry, there's room for all of the books. It's, I mean, just because somebody likes my book doesn't mean they're not gonna like your book, whether they're similar or not similar, it's, yeah. there's room for a lot of books. So that is a wonderful thing. And I mean, I've always felt that like, if, if someone reads your book and loves it, then it makes them wanna read another book. You know, right. like it's, it's, a, it's a plus plus. It, it, you don't read a book and think, oh, well, I'll never read another book as good as this one I shall not read. Right. You know, it just right. makes you want to have more. So, right. Yeah. You don't say, I read my book for the year. That's it. Exactly. <laughs> now, we talked a little bit recently, too, about the food service aspects of the book. So, I have to get into that because I just loved it. And your narrator, Casey, is a, a food server at a high end restaurant in Cambridge called Iris, fictional, right? The yeah, restaurant yeah. is fictional. Um, but I was working in restaurants in the Boston, Brighton area right around the same time that your narrator was. And I know you've had your share of restaurant jobs and it's plays so much into the book. And I just felt such nostalgia reading about this world. Um, mm -hmm. do, you, do you miss the restaurant world? And if so, what do you miss about it? Yeah, I do, I do. I mean, it was, um, it was such a, I, I loved it because the shifts went so quickly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once you'd worked yourself up to a fancy restaurant, you could make a lot of money in a night. And, uh, and you made such good friends. I mean, uh, the friends I made in, in restaurants, I still have. Uh, it's funny, one of my very best friends, I think we had two shifts together. <laughs> we, we were in college, we had just graduated from college. It was summer. And, uh, we had two shifts in, in North Carolina, Chapel Hill at a restaurant called Colonel Chutney's. And then I, I think we never worked together again. And then we both ended up working at different restaurants and different jobs that summer. But we like at two shifts, we were dear friends. We'd never met in all of college. We'd never met. We met, you know, when we graduated and our friendship has been so strong ever since. So I love that. Um, there about is something about it, right? There's something about being up at two in the morning with people, you know, folding silverware or folding napkins or whatever you're doing at two in the morning that you just, just don't get that in other jobs. You know, yeah. I really, really love it. I think you captured all of that so well. Did you used to have those, um, those terrible dreams that you forgot something, those waitressing yeah. dreams. I still have them. Yeah. I still have them. I, I, I just recently, I had a mushroom soup dream where I had <laughs> to get the mushroom soup to right. the people, but I couldn't get into the kitchen. It was the, the swinging door was locked, you know? And so I was stuck and they were staring at me, you know, classic. Well, those dreams are so stressful. I just remember waking <laughs> up in the middle of the night, like I didn't bring the water to the table too. Oh my, I know. <laughs> my goodness. Um, so, one thing you talked a little bit about this with your books being so different from each other. And I, that's one thing I really admire about you because I think you never are writing the same thing over and over, which is tempting to do. Um, so I love that. But at the same time, I'm curious about this because I, I once heard Ann Patchett say something about, I, I don't have the quote exactly, but she said, 
we novelists are all writing the same story over and over again. So yeah. even with your books being so different, do you think that's true? And if so, what story do you think you are writing over and over again? It's, uh, it's, I ask that question when I'm in your position all the time. Mm -hmm. And, and Henry James called it the figure under the carpet, which I thought was such yeah. a good, you know, this idea that, you know, it might be a different carpet, but underneath it's the same shape. Right. right. And, uh, I, I, I think I'm most interested in, and you know how they, they categorize the, like the seven plots, you know, stranger comes to town, mm -hmm. someone goes on a journey, blah, blah, blah. I can't, I don't even know them, yeah. but, um, mine, m mine is, um, someone gets herself, normally it's a her, herself into an extremely, extremely claustrophobic situation and it ramps up and ramps up and then, you know, it, it feels like it's just, you know, something's going to explode. You know, that's what I feel like. I'm always like putting my character in a situation and like shrinking the walls, you know, like, like Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, <laughs> you just, right. you just, you know, um, until, until the tension gets so bad that something has to dramatically change. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That's great. That's a great. <laughs> I don't know. The very first time I met you in person, I had been a fan of your books, but um, I met you, you were doing a talk at Brookwood School. Oh, this is a long time ago. This is when Father of the Rain, I think it was around Father of the Rain. And I didn't have kids at Brookwood, but I had a friend who worked there and had invited me. And you did go to Brookwood, right? I did go to Brookwood. Yeah. For those of you who are not from the area, it's a private day school in the area. Um, very highly respected. And um, then I know you went to a private high school in the area too. And I know you have a couple degrees under your belt and your narrator is so well-educated that she's in debt from it because she can't stop, um, you know, getting degrees. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, but she also has a lot of real world experience and so do you. So I'm curious what you think about how necessary both of those types of education are for the work of a novelist. Mm. Um, both kinds of education, real world and school. Right. Yeah. Incredibly important. You know, I, I, I it definitely probably we're real world more than, than school. Mm -hmm. um, but I do feel really fortunate. I mean, incredibly fortunate to have had the education that I had. Um, I mean, Brookwood was an incredible education. Um, and, uh, and then my father worked at Pingree, you know, in Hamilton. And so I, I got to go there for free. And so I was really lucky about that. And, uh, and, and I, I loved college. I loved college and I loved graduate school and everything I learned there. But I feel like I became a writer when I got out of school, you know, and I figured out the discipline you know, when you're in school, you have deadlines and so you meet them. But when you're out of school, it took me a really long time to figure out um, how to sit down every day and not sit down just when you're in the mood to write um, or when you feel like you have the time to write, but just making it a priority, making the time, no matter what. I think it took me about 10 years to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I did, I lived in a number of different countries and I, um, uh, I was always just totally scraping by though. Like I lived in different countries. It sounds very glamorous, but I was like a, a babysitter in France and Paris, you know? And uh, I mean, I, I think I made like a hundred dollars a week or something. And, uh, and then I got a job in Spain as a high school English teacher. And that was my biggest salary ever. I think it was um, $28,000 a year. And I felt so incredibly rich and I got to travel and you know it was it was fantastic I got my own apartment in Spain and I, I'm so glad for that I love languages I, I love languages and um so I, I you know I would never have given up any of that uh so both <laughs> well, yeah. your question. did you go right to grad school from undergrad or did you do something in between no I I um I worked in bookstores in, in Cambridge, actually, at the Harvard Bookstore and at Schoenhoff's Foreign Bookstore. And, uh, and then I worked at an inn in Maine 
um, on an island in Maine. And I, I did all kinds of things for about five years, I think, before I went to, oh, no more. Um, more than that, like five or seven years, I think, before I went to grad school. Okay. Um, I'm always so curious to talk to writers who have an MF. Wait, you have an MA or an You have an MFA. You know, I went to Syracuse and they, they now give an MFA, but it was called an MA, even though it was the same thing. Okay. Okay. So I'm always, I just love talking about the, I don't, I had, I went and got a graduate degree in English literature, not in writing. Cause I wasn't, I wasn't ready yet. I didn't know that's what I wanted to do. So I'm always uh -huh. curious about what you get out of an MFA or similar versus not having that. And I've seen writers do it successfully both ways. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, I loved it because I was broke and I, you know, they give you a scholarship and a stipend to do some teaching. And it just gave me time for two years to write. Um, but I chose Syracuse and I chose the MA because it was also, they had a ton of literature requirements. And like Iowa, I mean, not that I got into Iowa, but <laughs> Iowa, you don't, they don't have a lot of, at least they didn't back when I was applying, they didn't have a lot of requirements. And so I really wanted both the, the writing instruction, but I also wanted the literature instruction because I, I, I loved it. And I felt like my education was not by any means complete in, in English literature. So uh, I, and I, I love the time, but probably the most important thing for me at, in graduate school was meeting other writers who are then really good friends and great readers of my work. And, you know, um, that, that kind of lasts a lifetime. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm, I'm really grateful I did it. I think during it, it was confusing because you felt like I'm getting a degree that's not going to get me a job. You know? right. <laughs> um, and how am I going to do this? And how am I going to become a writer once I get out of school again? Mm -hmm. um, and so it doesn't always feel great while you're doing it, but I'm certainly glad I did it. Oh, I love that. Okay, great. <laughs> Um, now back to some specifics about the book. One thing I really admire is the restraint you show in the storytelling. It's a very, it has a restrained feel to it. Um, and I love that we never see any of the novel that Casey is working on, but we get little hints about it and hints about the novels of some of the other characters. We get a little bit about Muriel. She can't, she can't get her characters down the stairs, right? Or she, there's something she can't do with her characters. Maybe that's Casey. I don't know. Um, and then there's a little hint about I um, I think when she's talking to um, Oscars, uh, to the woman at his reading, and they oh, yeah, talk, yeah yeah and they talk about one part about oh the part about the glove in the book. So there's these little hints, but you never see it, and I love that. But I'm also curious: was any part of you ever tempted to write any of Casey's novel, or did any of your readers tell you that you needed to? Nobody told me I needed to. Thank God. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I was never ever tempted because mm -hmm. I didn't. I wanted the, that novel to be in the reader's imagination. You know, it could be whatever they imagined Casey to be writing. And if I had written some of it, um, it, would, it would have defined it in a way that I didn't think it needed defining. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I didn't, I didn't know if I could write, I, I, you know, how could I write a novel that was, in Casey's voice that was different from the narrative voice that we were getting right. from Casey. And that felt kind of funny. And I, yeah. I, I was never ever attempted to do it. And I was scared that people were gonna ask me to do it. And I was so glad they didn't. Nobody, <laughs> but I don't, I mean, I'm so glad you didn't too. I think it was perfect the way that it is, but I always wonder, cause there's always somebody who has an opinion about you should put this in or take this out. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, and I loved that there was something about Muriel said, you need to write the rape scene. So we know there's a rape scene, but we don't know, you know, why or what it is. And it's just this thing that right. Casey needs to do. And so I loved those little hints without the specifics. I thought that was beautiful. Um, what? I, I'll just add that the thing that that they that my editor really wanted me to do that I had to do that I was resisting doing was writing Casey's backstory. When I first handed in the novel, there was very little. There were just very small hints about the father and the mother, and I and I actually ended up, you know, maybe <laughs> it's so funny when when I get asked to to add things. You know, I think in their head, they want me to add like 20 pages or something. And I'll always end up adding like three <laughs> you know, or five. So I just added a little bit to kind of get more of a sense, but I didn't want to have a whole long 
backstory of her past, you know? Yeah, I love that. And I think sometimes that's all you need. You only need the little bit and that yeah. really fills it in and the reader can fill in the rest. But actually, I did want to ask about your relationship with your agent and editor. So you spoke mm -hmm. about your agent before. So you send it, you always send it to your agent first. Yes. And have you been with the same agent and editor the whole time or have you changed around? So I had, um, I had an agent for my first three books named Wendy Weil and mm -hmm. she was fantastic. And she died very suddenly after Father of the Rain. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I was first starting Euphoria or kind of in the middle of Euphoria, I had to do a little bit of an agent search. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I asked my editor who she'd recommend. And I asked a friend of mine who's an editor at Algonquin who I wait, I know her because I waited tables with her in North Carolina, <laughs> a different person. And, uh, and they, they both gave me a list. And the one person who was on both of their lists was an agent named Julie Bear. And so I was like, okay, that's a sign. <laughs> I'm not going to spend a lot of time, you know, searching around and I'll just write her and see what she says. And, but I, she, and, but she wrote and she said, well, let me see some of the book you're working on. And I was like, oh my God, I cannot show her a book about Margaret Mead in 1931 in Papua New Guinea. Like I was so embarrassed of that book that I, I couldn't bring myself. So I was like, ah, you know, I'll send it to you when I'm done. And then years went by. Um, but I did end up going to New York and talking to her oh, and, so um, great. Yeah. and I just loved her so much. It was just click, click, click. And so um, that's been really, really great. And then I've had my same editor for every single book. Oh, you have, okay. That's unusual. Cause often people have the same, Asian and switched editors last. I, I don't know. know if we talked about this, but my agent is Elizabeth Weed, who's in the book group with Julie. Oh, right. So, we did not talk about that. I saw that later. It's so cool. I don't think I even knew that we were sisters in that way. Um, I love that. Well, the book group is a wonderful agency. I feel so lucky to be with them. And Julie is is so great too. I mean, they're all they're all wonderful there. Oh. So you've had the same editor the whole time. That's um that's unusual for this many books. And I know my editor has you know has been at Grove Atlantic this entire time. Elizabeth Schmidt, she's so fantastic, and we just you know there there's we just can't change that relationship. You know, it's yeah, that's it's, great. It's, we work really really well together. That's good. And in general, how much editing does she do? I get the feeling that you your book is pretty you work on it a long time before you show it so do you get edited a lot or do you show it and it's pretty close to pretty close to done it's you know there's usually not huge kind of structural changes there'll be something like that like we need a little bit more about x you know and that's kind of the most major thing I have to do and uh and it's always, you know, hard for me. <laughs> um, but I do, I, I, I do try to hand it in as polished as I can possibly make it. I have a writer's group um, here in, in, in Maine. And, uh, and so I give it to them and they're super harsh. So, so usually I've kind of heard the worst already and, okay. and I've tried to, tried to fix the big problems. And um, I just do draft after draft after draft. And then, and then finally I hand it into my editor and, and yeah, it's a lot of line edits, but you know, we do a full like two or three drafts um, of, of, of her line edits. And thank God I, I have an editor who's still line edits. Um, right. And we're very, I mean, we, we haggle and haggle over so many words and, you know, I don't know, sentences. It's it's really that's my favorite part of the whole thing is haggling with her at and the end. To that point. Well, that's very kind of you to give it to her so polished. My um drafts that I give my editor are such a mess <laughs> because I show it to her and my agent pretty close to first. And so they pour them, they get a real mess. So And how do they do they does the agent tackle it first and then the editor? How's that work? Um, at this point, because I have I've had the same editor for a few books, we are mostly the agent will read it, but the the editor gets right in there. So I think earlier and I've had to change editors three times just because of people moving jobs. Mm -hmm. So I know my agent better than I know have known some of my editors. So um 
at this point, the editor gets right in there, but a little earlier, I think the agent would do more and say, is this ready yeah. to show this person who just took yeah. you on, you know, because yeah. it's a big responsibility. So um, I, I certainly depend on both of them for sure, but I should probably get a writer's group so that I'm not handing them such a mess, you know, that's very, very, very smart of you. Um, let's see, let me see how we're doing for questions and time. Oh, it's 1030 already. My goodness, I knew the time would fly. Okay, we have a lot of questions. So I think I think we're going to go right into the questions. I do have my, I do have my 20 quick questions of this or that if we need them at the end. Oh, <laughs> so good. I like this. Let's go into the Q&A and see how we do. And then okay. if we have time, we will, um, we'll keep going. So Laura wants to know, what is your writing routine like? And I know you have your notebook there, so maybe you can show us. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I always, I, I know for a while, I've felt a little bit of a fraud talking about my writing routine because I just, I just haven't been writing regularly lately. You know, I've just had a lot of Zooms and I have a collection of short stories that's coming out in November. So I've been editing that and I've been writing an essay and writing short stories. And anyway, I, uh, in a, in a, in a real world, which hopefully will, will start on Monday, I'm always saying next Monday, next Monday, I'm gonna start my new novel. Um, uh, it, it, I, I just, I get up at a pretty, pretty regular hour of like seven or eight or something. And then I have breakfast and I go up to my study with my cup of tea, my black tea that I need so badly um, to write. And, uh, and I write by hand. And, and so usually I just write, I don't know, from about nine to two or nine to three or something like that. And uh, um, I have my notebook that I wrote yeah. Writers and Lovers with. And so I usually, like right now, I'm gonna start a new novel. I have about 10 pages here and there. Like I, I've been writing on this manual typewriter and I've been writing in a notebook and I've been writing on the computer, lots and lots of notes. And so that's all kind of swirling around, but I, I do have a new notebook and I will, I'll start, you know, writing from there hopefully on Monday. Um, but I usually just start like right at the beginning, page one. And so this is the first page of, um, of, of this novel. Uh -huh. And I didn't have the title right away. I added that later. And I, it also doesn't have the first paragraph that I add, also added later, the first paragraph that appears. But then it just says, um, Adam watched me walk his dog. And so it was all, first this whole book was in the past tense. And then I changed that because I like the way I make a lot of changes based on the first page. And so I just see how I want it to sound on the first page and then I'll make all these changes. Um, if like, you know, if I have to change from first person to third person or past to present or something like that. And then while I'm writing, I, I, um, I always have a bunch of notes in the back in the way back, I keep a blank, about 20 pages of blank um, pages. To, to just keep notes because as I'm writing, I start to get the ideas about what's gonna happen next and what's gonna happen next. And, uh, and then when, when, when that gets kind of crazy um, and I can't remember what's gonna happen next and what my ideas were, then I make a, like, a little timeline. Um, and so <laughs> this, you know, it's not, it's not exactly what happens. It just kind of helps me like get going. And so like, there are things on here that say like, second visit to father's possible tumor. Um, she never makes a visit to the father's. He never has a tumor. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so there are lots of things that I, that I, you know, I'll go down a road and I'm like, no, no, or I'll just veer off and that won't happen. Uh -huh. um, and so, and forgive me, if you've seen me talk before, I often talk about my routine in this way. And so okay. I apologize. There's a couple that. questions about your process. So this is good, we're covering all of them. So perfect. And then the very, very last page is my writing log. And I just write the day I wrote and how much I wrote. Oh, um, that's a nice idea. So, I've never done that. I might start yeah. that. I don't know. It's just accountable. I don't make my, I don't, uh, a lot of people, particularly men, um, will say, I sit down and if I, and I write until I have 4,000 words or whatever, you know. Um, I do not do that because my entire writing life, except for the past two years, one year, <laughs> has been um, picking up my children at school at, you know, either at 12 or two or three or whenever. And so I've never beat myself up 
for how much I haven't written that day. I just try to write down when I write and how much I write. And I, I try to keep it really emotionally neutral. Um, and you know, what I can do is what I can do. I was there, I was at the desk, it was four and a half pages or it was a half page, you know, it, I, I try not to, to get all wrapped up in, in that because it will happen. Um, and uh, um, what else do I want to say about that? I, 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 the other kind of thing about my writing routine is that this is just my pure creative self. Like it's, it's where I put all of my ideas. I don't worry. Um, I, I don't worry that it doesn't sound good or that it's not good or that I, I just try so hard and I don't do very well at it, but I try really hard not to bring the critic in, not to be really, really critical of what I'm putting in here. The time for the critic is when I put it on the computer. And so that is a whole revision stage that, that really involves the critic slash editor. Um, but, but this, I try so hard just to tell myself, you can fix it later, you can fix it later, just keep moving, keep the momentum going, just keep telling the story. And that, that's probably the most important thing about, about my writing process is just, is just to really try to keep it moving. Um, put things in parentheses if you can't figure out how to say them. I do not spend, I really, really, really like a tight sentence but that comes sometimes later, you know, it doesn't always come right away. And sometimes I have to put something in a, in parentheses and say vaguely what I'm trying to get at later. I'll treat, I'll, I'll figure out exactly how to say it and make sure that it's kind of the right rhythm and everything. But I try not to be a perfectionist in my first draft. And, and, and like Casey says in the, in the novel, you know, a painter doesn't go, from one side of the canvas to the other, like meticulously filling in every single thing. You know, you just have to kind of get out the shape and the, the composition of it. And then you go back in and you go back in and you put layer upon layer upon layer and, and fix it very, very slowly. And sometimes you have a mind toward the dialogue and sometimes you're thinking about the voice and sometimes you're thinking about the theme or the plot or, you know, all, and you can't hold all of that at once in a first draft. And so, you just kind of have to give yourself a lot of room um, and, and a lot of time to do it. I think that's really good advice. And that's something I tell people too, when they ask about how can I write a book? And you, the answer is you just have to, you have to write a book. You have to write a draft. And if you don't have anything to work with, you'll never have anything to work with. But I agree. It's tempting sometimes just to keep going back and fixing that first paragraph, but you'll never move beyond it. So I think that it's great to hear that from you too. Uh, and one thing I think it's, it's really important to just ignore that voice that wants to say it's not good enough. You know, it's not, it's not good. It's a piece of crap. Like you just, you don't know. You don't know. I try so hard. That voice is always there. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just try to step around it really. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not very good at getting rid of it, but I just, I try not to listen very carefully anymore or get like emotionally connected to that. Right. I think that's really good advice because nothing is good the first time. I mean, I mean, there's no published book that came out beautifully the first time. So yeah, it's wonderful to hear. Um, there's one thing I don't want to forget to ask about. That's my own question, but I know we have a lot of questions here. So really quickly, I wanted to ask about Tony Collette um, adapting the book for film. And I know you can't talk as much about it or don't even know that much about it yet, but can you very briefly tell us how that came about or how you found out? I, my, I have a, a, you know, an, an agent in LA who deals with that sort of thing at CAA and out of the blue, like, you know, uh, Tony Collette is interested. She loved the book. She was recommended. Um, it was recommended to her by a bookseller in Australia, in her town in Australia, um, who, who often tells her what are the good books that may be possibly good movies. And, um, uh, so she wanted to get on the phone and we got on the phone and, um, and that was, you know, probably last end of last March, maybe mm -hmm. like, so a year, you know, 13 months ago. Yeah. Um, and, and then kind of slowly, slowly, she like pulled a lot of pieces together and got, um, you know, money financing and, um, she has a co-writer to write the screenplay and, 
Um, she's going to direct it, which is so exciting. She, this would be her first feature film that she's directed. And I just think she's so incredibly, incredibly wildly talented. And I'm so thrilled to work with her. And I just, every contact I've had with her has just been so wonderful. So oh, that's so exciting. I'm a huge, huge fan of hers and her work. So I can't mm -hmm. wait to see what happens with it. Congratulations on that. Thank you. All right. Somebody had a question. I have always wanted to know this. Um, Suzanne wants to know, I'm wondering about Casey's background as a talented, accomplished golfer. Where did that idea come from? Were you <laughs> a golfer or one of your kids? No, I, it's so funny because there was supposed to be so much more golf in that book than there is, but I could not bear to do the research. <laughs> I bought like a stack of golf books. Um, I'm just not a golfer. Um, I, I love tennis. And I wanted it to be tennis, but I had a lot of tennis in Father of the Rain. So yeah. I felt like oh, I couldn't right. do tennis yeah. anymore. Right. And I needed kind of a waspy country clubby sport that wasn't tennis. So my selections, it was not, you know, I did not have any choices. Uh -huh. um, and, and so it had to be golf. And uh, I wanted her to go like be in a tournament with her father. Like I had all these ideas about things that were going to happen. And then it just ended up being a mini golf scene. <laughs> yeah, well, I love that. And I've always wondered, is that really, I've always wondered if golfers are also really good at mini golf mm -hmm. or two separate things like tennis and ping pong. But is it true that if you're a good golfer, you're good at mini golf? I have no clue. <laughs> well, it worked. It definitely worked. Casey um, was. Casey was good at it. Right. <laughs> I love that scene. I really, I'm terrible at mini golf and I've never played regular golf. All right. Um, oh, I, let me just say one more thing about the golf thing, though. I was really interested in having Casey um, having to be groomed by a parent to do something that ultimately was not her thing, you know, and that that situation. That's why I did it, because I'm interested in that. I'm interested. You know, I, I definitely had a father who wanted all of us to be one thing and none of us were. We all rejected it. It was like a incredible pain for him and I just find that interesting so uh so I you know and then it's more interesting when actually the person is actually good at it and they still don't want to do it and they decide so, not to do it right yeah, yeah. and then, then the anger that the father still has about that all those years later that was really interesting and, and just the idea that you know a parent wants to fulfill their dream through their child I think that is a a very kind of almost natural and and very disturbing thing that people do, you know? Well, having just come from the session on the college admission scandal, oh. and we were talking, they were talking about that, I totally agree with that. And that's, that's a big risk, I think. Teresa yeah. wants to know, what is the best piece of writing advice you received that you still use? Oh, it's a really good question. Uh, you know, I, 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 I often go back to um, the Nike ad, you know, <laughs> that is the best piece of advice there is. Just do it. Do it. Yeah. You know, like I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if there's anything better. You just have to do it and you can talk yourself out of it in so many different ways. There's so many ways to avoid writing. Yes. Um, and, uh, and, and even when you've written, you know, like five novels or six novels, like you have, I mean, I don't know if you feel that, but it, it doesn't, it's still hard. It's still hard to sit in the chair and do the work. And so I would always, really I would always rather organize a kitchen drawer than write any day of yeah. the week. So it's so tempting to find all those little things you could do. And exactly. Stuff. That you can accomplish and that has a beginning, a middle and an ending. Right. You, know? you can see something there. Yeah. And could be done in a day. Absolutely. Um, let's see. Uh, Jennifer wants to know when in your life did you first know that you wanted to be a writer? Well, my mom had a friend who um, was a dressmaker in town, um, Mr. Nicolosi, and he, he made my wedding dress. And when he was measuring me for my wedding dress, he told me that I came into his shop, I rode my bike downtown, I came into a shop with a little pad, tablet from Brookwood, it was a Brookwood school tablet and, uh, and a pencil. And I looked up and I said, I'm gonna be a writer someday. I have no memory of that, none, none, none. But I do remember reading um, the first two Judy Bloom novels and thinking, and that's probably when I was eight or nine and thinking, I wanna do that. I, I wanna write books just like this. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I don't know where that came from. We never did any writing, like creative writing in school ever. 
Right. And uh, so I don't know. And then I kind of, I, I don't know. I, I think I had tried to write a novel in fifth grade because my friend Amy Nix was writing a novel. <laughs> and, uh, I only got 20 pages in and yeah. And then, uh, and then in high school, I had a teacher who taught creative writing and he in, in uh, sophomore year or freshman year, he said, he told me after he had us write a poem and he told me, I teach a creative writing class to 11th graders and 12th graders. You should take it when you get to be, you know, a, a junior in high school. And so that was it. That was it. Uh -huh. That one, that one sort of quasi invitation to take that class. And I never, ever, ever, ever wanted to do anything else. Oh, I love it. Great answer. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, let's see. Um, sorry, I lost. Okay. Somebody wants to know why you set this book in the nineties. Mm. You know, it wasn't intentional when I got the idea I didn't think this happens in the 90s. I, you know, when I got the idea, I saw Casey, I saw the driveway, I saw the dog, I saw the potting shed, I saw Adam. I knew that Casey was writing a novel. Um, I knew she worked at a restaurant and I knew her mother had died. Uh -huh. but I did not know it was the 90s and I started writing it. And then I got to the end of that chapter and she gets that answering machine message and suddenly, you know, and so the answering, you know, she comes home from work and she pushes her answering machine. I'm like, oh, <laughs> this is in the 90s. Um, because I love that. And I love that she had phone. to get her phone calls at the restaurant because there weren't cell phones, you know. Oh, right. hey, Jen, you're back. Oh, no, we're done. There's so I many. Know. It's, you know, it's a bummer with, that everybody like, oh, when I show up. <laughs> Jen, <laughs> it's so disappointing. Oh, hi, Jen. <laughs> Uh, I mean, there's so, this is such a great conversation that I hate to cut it off and we still have plenty of questions. So I apologize to everybody who's asking questions. And, no, you know, I do too. It's so hard uh, to get to our 20 okay. questions. Oh, let's, we have so much to do. But uh, you know what? Uh, let's do one more. We'll, we'll do more one more and then we have to wrap up. Okay. <laughs> Christina wants to know, what are you currently reading? And one of my questions was, what is the last book that you read that you loved? So either one of those would be perfect. Oh, okay. Um, so I just have to, well, the book I'm reading is actually propping up this uh, computer. <laughs> so, um, I am finally reading Cloud Atlas. Ah, I've never That's read my it. favorite book of all really? time. Really? <laughs> it's incredible. I can't believe I avoided it. Oh I've my God, that's the best book. answer you could have ever given. It's <laughs> really funny. I love it. I love it. Right. And, and it's funny, for, for me, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm often writing a novel. And so I'm often, my reading is all about finding the, the right book that's going to feed my novel that I'm writing. And so it has to be perfect. And I, I throw out a lot of really good books because it's not feeding me in the right way. It's not feeding my work. And this is feeding me so perfectly. I just love okay. it. Oh, okay. uh, I'm so glad that we asked that last question. <laughs> I'll read that I'm so glad you liked it so much <laughs> yes so um thank you so much lily for joining us and meg thank you for a fabulous interview yeah thank this you was, everybody I who's here and i'm coffee. so sorry that we didn't get to all the questions there were just so many and they're all really good so next time next time we're exactly gonna we're gonna have to have you back <laughs> okay for all the questions so um everybody who attended thank you so much we've still got more events today yeah. so i hope we're gonna see you throughout the day so have a great day everyone Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Meg. Thank you, Jen. Take care, everybody.